Nearly 400 years ago, the Dutch East India Company landed on the island of Formosa and set up shop. They hunted deer, grew rice, and fought the aboriginals. In 1662, the Ming loyalist Koshinga besieged the now tourist spot of Fort Zealandia, ejected the Dutch, and established the anti-Qing kingdom of Formosa. I'm not quite sure why I brought this up, except to say that the Dutch have had long ties to Formosa. These ties continue to this present day, with Taiwan and the Netherlands having consistently collaborated in the electronics industry. Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC, is today the world's leading independent foundry, but they never would have even gotten started without the help received from Dutch multinational Philips in those critical early years of its existence. This video is about that shared history. But first, I want to talk a little bit about the Patreon. If you want to help support the channel, I suggest taking a look at the Early Access tier. You can get access to a large backlog of videos queued up and waiting to be released to the public. The number fluctuates, but right now it is about 15 or so. Just head on over to the Patreon page and just take a look. I deeply appreciate anything you'd be able to sign up for. Thanks, and on with the show. Philips is a Dutch multinational corporation headquartered in Amsterdam. The company currently named Philips now focuses on the health industry, but it had once been the biggest electronics firm in the world. The company has produced and introduced some of the most iconic electronic devices in history, items like the compact disc format and more. And it was a big early investor in Taiwan. The exploitation of East Asian resources and labor by European companies is a common thing with roots dating back to the mid-1800s. Stimulated by the spread of European imperialism, these companies sought access to the riches of Asia. After the end of World War II, Philips moved back to the Netherlands after its founding Philips family fled the country to escape the Nazi invasion. The war and its preceding years had seen huge changes in the world paradigm. Philips had a few lamp and radio factories in Indonesia, India, and Malaya, like other colonialists back then, but those factories were nationalized in the 1950s. These nationalizations reduced Philips' Asia presence to a couple joint ventures in Japan. Despite this, the company pondered re-entering East Asia in the 1960s, following a trend of Western companies outsourcing their manufacturing operations to East Asia to take advantage of the cheaper labor there. Hong Kong had been a leader in this operation and was once the world's biggest electronics exporter. Taiwan's economy at the time was largely agricultural and low technology. Wood products, textiles, rubber goods, the like. But the government wanted to change that and tried to find partners to make it so. The Taiwanese government reached out to Philips about investing in Taiwan in the 1950s. Taiwan had recently established an office in Rotterdam looking for partners to help found an electronics industry on the island. At the government's invitation, CEO Fritz Philips visited Taiwan himself to scout for investment opportunities. Fritz was an interesting guy. The only member of the Philips family to remain in the Netherlands, he is credited for saving 382 Jews during the Nazi occupation and is recognized as a righteous among the nations for his actions. He also lived to be 100. Wow. The decision to invest in Taiwan over other areas in East Asia, like Japan, was not obvious. There were very real reasons against it. So why did they do it? The first had to do with labor costs and stability. Wages were rising around the world, but not in Taiwan. Yet at the same time, the Taiwanese were highly educated due to the work done during the Japanese colonial era. As for labor stability, the nationalist government had made it clear that they were not willing to brook any labor unrest. Taiwan Island was in the midst of the White Terror during this period. Things seemed to be peaceful, but Phillips failed to see the turmoil and suffering beneath that. From the capitalist perspective, all was well. That's a sad thing considering Fritz's background during the World War. He should have known better. Second, Philips did not succeed in Japan. They had a few joint ventures there, but the Japanese partner was firmly in charge of those. The country had recovered from World War II, but by then Philips had sensed that the market's opportunities was close to them. Third was the China factor. The nationalist government believed back then that they would take back the mainland and prior to China acquiring the nuclear bomb, it actually seemed possible. Phillips thought that having a foothold in Taiwan first would give them an advantage if either the Kuomintang succeeded in its invasion of the mainland, or relations warm with the Communist Party. And lastly, the Kuomintang government was extremely friendly to Phillips. The company's management was impressed by ministers like K.T. Lee, 
who promised that he would be able to cut any red tape that Phillips would come across. A free trade zone in Kaohsiung would be created for the company has actions backing their words. And lastly, the government appealed to CEO Fritz himself. Chiang Kai-shek awarded Fritz Phillips the Order of the Brilliant Star of the Republic of China. Fritz, of course, wasn't entirely swayed by this, but he came to see a reason for investing in Taiwan that was not entirely economic-based. He wanted to invest in a developing country and help Taiwan in its anti-communist struggle. He came back home and pushed through the investment of a Taiwanese light bulb factory. The immediate success of this investment would lead to a television picture tube factory, and then more. By 1971, Philips Taiwan would be the single largest foreign investor in the country, and the second largest overall after the venerable Taitong Corporation. After the tepid success of United Microelectronics Corporation, the government decided to give the semiconductor industry another try with a company called TSMC. CEO Morris Tang envisioned a company that would utilize the island's relative manufacturing strengths to service companies who wanted to make their own chips but could not afford to build a fab. In order to get started, TSMC needed a semiconductor process technology that did not lag the market by too much. The Taiwanese government approached various Western companies looking for a technology partner willing to contribute their knowledge and skills. Companies like Intel and Texas Instruments were approached, but both turned down the offer. Intel would later contract with TSMC as a customer a few years down the line. Philips was the only company who took the offer, allowing TSMC to offer a 1.5 micron node that was only two or so generations behind the rest of the market. Philips also offered the fledgling company the critical protection of its patent portfolio. 80% of its technologies came from the Dutch multinational. Considering that the company was looking to get international customers from the get-go, this was a big deal. In return, Philips got a stake in the company alongside private and public investors. At TSMC's founding, they received 28% of the company, the second largest shareholder after the National Development Fund's 48% share. It would end up being one of the most successful seed investments in the history of the semiconductor industry. TSMC's first two years of operations, the quote-unquote startup, made 2 billion NTD in revenue and changed the semiconductor industry forever. The relationship was so successful that over a decade later, the two companies again partnered to launch a joint venture in Singapore to compete with the growing chartered semiconductor. The company constructed a 2 billion SGD fab that continues to serve the local Singapore semiconductor market. I talked about this briefly in my video about chartered. Starting in about the 1980s, it became clear that Philips was struggling. It was big, the 12th biggest European company in 1992 but it was not carrying the weight well. The company had lost its position as a leading electronics firm to competitors like Sony. Profits had deteriorated within the core business, but a variety of accounting changes adopted throughout the 1980s had hidden the damage from investors. Then suddenly, in 1990, the company unveiled a shocking 4 billion Dutch guilder net loss after years of billion guilder profits. It was time to restructure and age gracefully. The company slowly spun off various parts of its empire into independent companies. Two of these spin-offs continue to have close relations with TSMC to this day. The first spin-off happened way back in 1984 when the company launched a joint venture with ASM International. This joint venture would eventually become ASML, a maker of lithography machines. Over time, the company would come to be a world leader in that market, defeating its Japanese rivals Nikon and Canon. Today, it is the only supplier of extreme ultraviolet lithography machines, the $150 million machines for achieving the 7 nanometer process node and below. It worked closely with TSMC, amongst others, to help develop and deliver this super advanced technology. Later, Philips spun off its semiconductors business entirely. In 2006, what was once Philips Semiconductor was purchased by a consortium of private equity firm investors, including KKR and Silver Lake Partners, and renamed NXP Semiconductors. NXP is a maker of semiconductors for automotive and digital networking industries, amongst others. When we talk about the automotive shortages plaguing today's factories, those chips are the kind that NXP makes. The Dutch American company continues to use TSMC as an external foundry partner to augment their own manufacturing. Despite these restructurings, Philips held its shares in TSMC for over 20 years. They got in when the company was worth $200 million, 
They sold the last of those shares in 2008, with the company then worth $50 billion. Today, TSMC is worth about $500 billion, give or take market fluctuations. Philips invested more into Taiwan than any other Western electronics company, and they did it despite knowing all the risks of investing in a politically and militarily unstable island just 100 miles away from a communist country. Don't get me wrong, they made a lot of money in setting up shop in Taiwan, but they could have also made a lot of money elsewhere. The company today known as Philips is no longer in the semiconductor space, but the entity's siblings still are. The shared history between TSMC and Philips continue to this day, pushing for the technological leading edge. All right, everyone, thanks for watching. That's it for today. If you want to drop a line and say hello, then you can email me at john at asianometry.com. I'll try to get back to you as soon as I can. Make sure to hit up the email newsletter, sign up, um, take a look at some of the posts there. I think they're all pretty interesting. Until next time, take care of yourselves out there. It's a crazy world. I'll see you again soon.